In this week's news roundup, flood bill expected to far exceed December 2011 event, MP Nick Smith visits affected businesses and residents, Pig Hunter goes to jail and catching up with Nelson Filmmaker. The flooding which ravaged the Tasman region last Sunday created a new record rainfall and possibly the highest number of insurance claims for such an event. Our camera captured some of the damage caused by the deluge and we caught up with Waimea Village resident Ethel Murdoch who took the precautionary step of vacating her home as floodwaters rose. Ethel, <laughs> Waimea Village has sustained some damage down here in the lower area of the village. Yes, it's come from the creek over there, rushed down their street and into, mainly into this street here. Yes. And there's two houses or maybe three, could be four that are full of water. My house has come right up to the top of the door, but not gone inside, but my garage is absolutely, it's like a river was going through it. Oh, absolutely flooded my yard, and I've got a, a floating deck out there, which is, yeah, all over the place. So this uh, is a bit tough. Are, are you all pulling together? Management oh, yes. is, is assisting here. Yes. And I, I see him busy on the tractor. People have been out sweeping the street in front of their place, and yeah. yes, we're talking to one another, yeah. pulling together. That's yeah, great. Yes. That's great. Yeah, it's so, amazing yeah. how a bit of adversity can link oh, yes. everyone in. Yeah, we're pretty pretty strong um, bonded in here. Yeah. <laughs> we need to be. <laughs> Goodness, Ethel, there's quite a bit of damage here. I can see by the freezer that's been upturned. You've lost a lot of goods here. The carpet is completely sodden. It looks like there's been a hurricane through your garage. Yes, that's what I thought when I opened the door. Just amazed at how far it had all travelled because it was all packed up in this corner. Now it's just, yeah, mm -hmm. like a hurricane's gone through it. Mm. Devastating. I feel shocked and, yeah. <laughs> Violated by the weather, I would That's say. Right. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, I guess so. Yeah. We spoke with local National MP Nick Smith this week about the weather bomb that hit the region. Nick, we've just had a significant rain event in the Nelson region which has severely impacted the region and uh, you've been out there visiting people that have been badly affected, haven't you? Yes, I have. Been meeting both with families and businesses. The rainfall event we had on Sunday was a real weather bomb. It was out the extreme end. The most heartfelt cases have been families uh, where they've had water rolling through their house within an hour, you know, sort of a real sort of a um, disaster, instant type response. Uh, they've got cars that are wrecked, their household belongings are wrecked, trying to organise alternative accommodation. Housing New Zealand has had some of its five houses have been badly affected uh, and you've got families that have got out basically with just the clothes of which they are wearing. Uh, the businesses, uh, we have about eight businesses that have had water through their premises. Many of those have had half a million dollars each worth of damage to their equipment. Uh, and of course we've had the Saxon Field Stadium, which is one of Nelson's great facilities, and, and uh, a floor and mud uh, through that facility as well. So in order of, of disasters, it's up there. Uh, I don't know what's unlucky about Nelson having in December 2010 being hammered as well. Uh, this was unusual in the intensity of the rainfall was just so strong, particularly in Richmond. Now, um, are there any lessons that we need to learn from this, you know, in terms of, you know, the way in which uh, infrastructure is developed? To some degree, an event of this strength uh, is uh, you'll never build the infrastructure to be able to cope with that much rain and we got, we got unlucky as well in that the high tide was right at six o'clock when the weather bomb uh, hit Richmond. I think the council is going to need to get its engineers and just check out areas like in the Wakato estate in that Arbally area whether the drainage facilities are up to scratch and whether there needs to be some additional investment in infrastructure. I feel particularly for those households that were whacked with a one in a hundred year flood in 2010 hit again last weekend uh, and that's where there needs to be some review. In terms of Main Street Richmond, uh, yes there was damage there. Again I'm um, spending some time with those businesses this afternoon and seeing where I can help. I think in that situation it was just such an extreme weather event that you're never going to have a stormwater system that's going to be able to cope with that much water that quickly. 
certainly. Now in terms of insurance, like obviously there may be some families out there that aren't insured, what do you suggest for these people? Well uh, sadly a number of the families uh, have not got insurance and that makes it particularly tough. It's a bit of a hard call for public agencies because if you completely bail out people uh, that don't have insurance, well what's the point of having it? I, I take a bit of a compassionate view and particularly where you've got young kiddies, uh, families with no car, no house, no furniture, no clothes, uh, so have been organising food grants, trying to get them support through uh, organisations like St Vincent de Paul and some of the Five Shift Foundation grants to get them through, uh, and of course trying to get them uh, accommodation. So uh, the most tragic family cases are where they don't have insurance and they're going to take a hard hit. And they can contact the ministry, can't they? Yeah, through WINS we're getting them some support and uh, we're doing our very best as an office to try and support those families and there are about five families in that situation. Meanwhile, Nelson Mayor Aldo Michio has inspected flood damage to Stoke after Sunday night's deluge. His first visit was to Wakatu Industrial Estate on Tuesday, where businesses were busy cleaning up after the flood. Mayor Michio says he was surprised by the sheer force of water that hit Sunday night. One business he said he went to had a really heavy equipment forced to the back of its building, and he was amazed at how high the water had reached. He says his thoughts go out to all the businesses and Stoke residents who were hit by these floods. He says there's a heap of cleaning up going on and they can be assured that council's busy doing its bit to fix roads and facilities and get them back to working order as soon as possible. Council inspectors are continuing to assess the scope of damage to Stoke. The sheer power of the flooding has undermined some footpaths and lifted lids off manholes, but clean-up work is well underway in various areas including Orphanage Creek, which overflowed and caused damage to nearby roads, footpaths and abutments. Saxton Stadium was hit particularly hard and is now closed indefinitely while the wooden floors are repaired. However, the grounds around the stadium will be able to be opened. Council will keep the public updated on developments. There is a boil water notice for council reticulated and personal bores in the Mortaweka area and people are being advised not to take shellfish or swim off the Hunanui beach due to the sewerage overflow from Bells Island. The financial cost of Sunday night's flooding damage to the region is estimated by insurers to be much more than $16.8 million that was spent on the December 2011 floods. Local pig hunter John David Wells was sentenced to two and a half years in prison in the Nelson District Court this week and was ordered by Judge David McKeg to pay $2,000 in reparation to his victim. Wells pleaded guilty to one charge of unlawful sexual connection with a young person who was in his charge on December 15, 2012. He said he'd asked his victim when reaching an isolated area if they should have sex while taking her out on a pig hunting trip and she'd said no. He then persisted and eventually convinced her to have sex with him. Wells' previous convictions did not include sexual offending. Wells had apparently known the victim since she was a baby and had seriously breached the trust of her and her family. Judge McKeg said that consent under duress is not consent at all. He says this was a gross assault on the innocence of the girl concerned. One bar and two off-licence premises have been caught selling alcohol to a minor in recent controlled purchase operations. Nelson Police Alcohol Harm Reduction Officer Sergeant Steve Savage says police had run two controlled purchase operations in the last two weeks. The first involved visits to 14 off-licences in the Tasman District Council area where no sales were made. The second operation, held on Thursday 18th of April in the Nelson City Council area, visited 17 off-licences and two on-licences. The off-licences at McCashins in Stoke and Brewers in Victory Square sold alcohol to a 16-year-old volunteer, as did Balea Bar in Tahunanui. Sergeant Savage says those businesses had been notified and a meeting would be held in midway to determine the outcome of the process. Sergeant Savage says it was a disappointing result. He says all people selling alcohol should adhere to the rule of checking ID for anyone who looks under 25 years. He says it should be simple, there's really no excuse for selling alcohol to minors. And in response to nationwide support, the Nelson Energy Team Trust has changed its name to the Kiwi Energy Trust. Chairman of the Trust, Nelson Mayor Aldo Michio, says the trust which formed last month has been pleasantly surprised by the amount of people signing up as interested parties from outside the area. 
Yeah, no, it's really exciting. We've had a lot of feedback over the last few weeks uh, nationally. Uh, we've had lots of um, organisations contact us and want us to take it, the approach nationally. So we've changed our name to Kiwi Energy Trust and um, we're working in collaboration with um, uh, local government New Zealand. Uh, we're talking with them about how best to approach the councils across the country to advocate to their um, residents and ratepayers to get involved in the scheme and also um, Grey Power, Grey Power Nelson, which is one of the largest Grey Power groups in New Zealand, are taking it to their national body conference to enlist the support of the national conference across New Zealand. So we expect it to be a lot, lot bigger and it's all about the size of the collective in terms of um, negotiating the best deal for a power users. So the more people that get on board, the better it will be. And now, especially in light of what we've heard from Labors and Greens, this, our approach <coughs> is significantly different in that it's voluntary, it's something that's market driven, and it's something that will actually happen now. So we expect to actually have negotiated a deal with the power industry to have same benefits, you know, of average $300 per, per power user in effect and being done before the end of this year and in a, and in a way that is, is led, by, led by the market and negotiated between the collective and the power industries. Now, from memory, I think uh, 20,000 was your aim, wasn't it? 20,000 signatures. So how many would you say you have so far? Yeah, so right now it is in the thousands and we expect to get a lot more and it's predominantly Nelson focused and so now when we take it nationally, um, Grey Power Nelson has 10,000 members, you know Grey Power across the country has over 100,000, uh, local government New Zealand has every single household in New Zealand as, as, as members so, so what will we expect, far bigger numbers and, and, and in turn we expect a you know, far better result. So it's really exciting, it's exciting to get this response. Um, you know, people do believe you know, power prices should be cheaper. Um, this approach here takes it in a more of a market-driven way, um, and so we're really excited about it, and we hope to be um, you know, in a position within the next four or five months where we can actually deliver some great results for all power users in New Zealand. A large turnout was expected this weekend at a march here in Nelson to oppose asset sales. I spoke earlier this week with Aotearoa is not for sales spokesperson Nelson Rachel Boyack about the event. March last year, uh, when we marched, we had uh, roughly around five to six hundred people um, turn out, which was a fantastic, you know, a fantastic turnout for for a provincial town like Nelson. So, um, yeah, we're working really hard to get the message out, and people should be seeing that message go out through a number of media during the week that we will be marching on Saturday. Now you say that, that an overwhelming majority of New Zealanders mm. oppose asset sales, yes. including the 400,000 yes. who signed a petition yes. for a referendum on the issue, and that includes 10,000 from Nelson. Yes, we know that um, both major political parties in opposition here in Nelson, so that's the Labour Party and the Green Party, each um, collected um, a few thousand, so around the 5,000 mark each. Um, unions also collected, I know one union in Nelson who collected around 800 signatures, so we know it's well over 10,000. I've personally spoken to a number of people because we've been out every week over the last year collecting those signatures, um, a big team of us, so I've spoken to heaps of people, hundreds of people who are really opposed um, to the sale of our assets and so I think there's a real strength of feeling in Nelson around this particular issue. Yes, and possibly buoyed by the fact that Labour and Greens have come yes. out this week with an electricity policy. Yes, yes, and then what happened yesterday, which was uh, you know really interesting, with mighty river power um, share sales being suspended temporarily, and so I think what it shows is that the government's on the back foot in a big way. Um, what they I think um, have underestimated is the strength of feeling from people, and particularly the lack of democracy being um, applied to this. Um, you know they've chosen to ignore that referendum, which I think is going to be very damaging for them in, in the in the next election um, in 2014. I think they should expect to see some a big public backlash if they actually ignore those 400,000 people and the subsequent referendum that will happen. And as I understand it, the government has had to rewrite its share offer. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think this goes back to the heart of the actual issue, which is that power prices are too high, and we've known that for some time. Um, one of the reasons that people have, I guess, 
um, perhaps not push back about that quite as hard is because at least the majority of those profits were going back into the government's pocket to then be reinvested into public services. Now with the with the sale of, of those shares to wealthy New Zealanders and also overseas investors, people are starting to say, hold on a second, I'm paying high prices and then the money's not going back to be reinvested into the services like health and education that I use. So that's one of the reasons there's been such a big push against it. So I think that the announcement from Labour and the Greens has really changed the game um, and it actually goes back to what the core issue is which is that electricity, um, the power that we use in our homes, it's not a luxury service, it's something everybody needs. Elderly and the children you know, need it when it's, um, when it's too expensive and when people are profiting from it, um, p wealthy individuals profit profiting from it, that's when people have a, a huge problem with that. So yeah, I think it's really changed the game this week and um, invigorated people. People are starting to realise, no, there are options, there are solutions, um, we can fight this. Um, and on Saturday, what we've asked the speakers to do is talk about what their solutions are. So I think it's a great opportunity for the public to have a conversation around what can we actually do to make sure that over the you know over the long term we've got a fair electricity sector that makes sure people can actually power power their homes and their businesses. Nelson woman Emma Hickey and her son Connor are a small family who have completed a large mission. The mission was Our Green Roadie, a documentary they've made about 50 New Zealand people and businesses who live and work in green ways. Emma Hickey Documentary maker, filmmaker, but now long feature length documentary maker. Nice of you to come to Mainland to talk to us about the success and completion of your great documentary, Our Green Roadie. Thank you for inviting me. Look, it's been such a journey, this whole documentary making process for you this time around. Can you tell us a bit about the fan funding that you? actually we last spoke to you about last year. How did that go? Well we went through the crowdfunding platform Pledge Me and I had a target of $9,750 and we actually made that target um, before the 28 days were up. We had some really generous pledges and um, lots of people got behind it and so that has enabled me to um, to employ an editor and a sound engineer and to do all the post-production and produce these DVDs. Look, Emma, just having a look at the trailer, you have met some really interesting people out there and what an education for Connor. Yes, it's been, it was truly phenomenal. I mean, it was a six month journey in our little van, like you saw our van. We had a bed built in the back of that and storage underneath and it was it was truly magnificent. I mean we met 70 families that we filmed, um, 50 made the final cut and Connor learnt such a lot, like it was a great educational experience as well as, you know, it was a great adventure. Has this changed your life do you think? <laughs> yes indeed, one of the, I mean there were many reasons why we did this and did it the way that we did um, and one of them was to to sort of sort out for ourselves what we wanted to incorporate in our lives um, in the way of being green and massive changes, yes, we're, we're, we're heading, we know what we'd like to do now and there's lots of ideas we'd like to incorporate and it's really exciting and it's a journey, not a destination, it's actually changing your mind and once you do, there are so many possibilities and it's really, it's exciting, it's a really cool way to live. When you had your final cut and you put it all together have you had a, a friendly screening of it to get feedback from people? Yes I have, limited though um, people think it's amazing Yeah, Highly entertaining Yes there's some really funny parts there's lots of, there's lots of wisdom in it, like it's a film that's very much from the heart and the way that I filmed um, like because it was just me and Connor, who was seven at the time, he took the photographs, I did the filming. We only did one take, ever. So it was real people sort of pausing in their busy lives. They would share their stories, um, sort of what motivated and inspired them to go down the track that they did. And yeah, it's, it's I don't know, it's a, it's a film that's from the heart and it's really, yeah, it's very real. There'll be something in there, I think everybody will find somebody that they can relate to and who can really kind of inspire them and maybe be a catalyst for change. Yeah. 
Now, Connor, he's such a wee gem, isn't he? Taking the photos beside Mum. And yes. I would say, would you say he's probably your biggest inspiration? Absolutely. Do you know, if it wasn't for him, I never would have even made my first film. I was a, an art and photography teacher in a high school up north, and I'd still probably be doing that. And it was only when somebody gave me a film you know, a children's film when he was really little and said, this is what people are watching. And, you know, and I was so kind of horrified. That was what sparked me to to make a, to learn how to make a film and, and make my first one. And, yes, I never would have gone around New Zealand for Our Green Roadie without him. Um, and I look back on it now and I wonder how on earth we did it, you know, in that little van for six months. That's a long time with a seven-year-old. Um, he was amazing mm-hmm. and he, he loved it and he... You know, he, he learned to use, I gave him my expensive SLR digital camera and he learned how to use it really confidently and, yeah, and he made friends wherever he went and he can milk a goat and knows how to make tea tree oil and there's so many things, yes. Mm. So it's life, been great. Yeah, life skills for him now. Yes. Yeah. So where to now? After this is all finished and you've got it nicely marketed and it's selling like hotcakes because I'm sure it will. This is a brilliant piece of New Zealand that you've managed Mm. to capture that has never been done before. What are you going to do then after that? Well I've actually got two ideas on the go for some more children's films. Um, I see a really big need to, to make a film that really inspires children so that let's just say the power goes out and there's no more petrol for cars and the machines kind of stop working, how would you roll a great big log from there to here? How would you cook your food? So kind of looking at old technology like solar powering and and using pulleys and physics principles to move things and actually do a whole lot of science experiments and projects with children um, that get them thinking outside the square. So it's not just a matter of flicking a switch and and there everything is, Mm. like actually how things work and how to, yeah, so kind of green science. Hmm. Emma Hickey, it's been a real pleasure to have you here today and I look forward to hearing more about the next project that you're throwing your life and soul into and um, look forward to being able to talk to you again about where next after that. Thank you very much. And now I speak to our CEO, Gary Watson, about the digital switchover. Well, the week has finally arrived and the big switchover is happening this weekend to digital television, isn't it, Gary? Well, what it actually is, is that the analog transmitters are all getting turned off. Okay, So when they say going digital, we've already been digital for over a year, and so is Freeview. It's actually that the digital is going to be the only way you're going to be able to watch television. So Monday morning, and you turn your analog TV on, you're just going to have snow, early winter. Okay. So for those of you who haven't switched over as yet, I'd suggest you uh, contact one of the antenna installers. They can advise you on the best type of set-top box, or they can put you in a UHF aerial and get you all tuned in. They'll show you what to do. For those of you who are over the age of 75 with a community services card, then there is a phone number you can call. It's 0800 838 800. And if you call that number, that's going digital, and uh, tell them you want a set-top box, and they will send a person around to uh, install it. They'll tune it all in, and they'll show you how to operate it, and it's all for free. So how's that? Excellent. Yeah. So in terms of uh, our channels, those of you watching us right now on the digital, you're already tuned in and uh, so nothing has changed there. Uh, There are a small number of households that are yet to change over. Uh, If they're just going to ignore it, then there's going to be no picture from Monday. So uh, Sunday night, everything gets all switched off and uh, Monday onwards, we're digital only. So those who haven't made the switch will know on Monday whether they have or haven't. Yes, I mean, the way it does affect a lot of folks is that a lot of people have got two or three TVs in the house. They might have one in the kids' room or the rumpus room or somewhere. They may have upgraded and gone digital with the main one in the lounge, but remember all of the other TVs around the place are 
going to have a problem. So, you know, you can buy a set-top box and make sure it's a terrestrial set-top box. Uh, the satellites don't fall into the trap there because the satellites really only if you've got no terrestrial service like people down in Murchison and, and uh, the likes of. Their only option is satellite and there is no high definition on it. Uh, it's very limited in any future capacity because the sky has basically used up all the, the channels on the satellite. So that's sort of the last resort really, um, but it does provide a good service. But if you're in Nelson, Tasman, uh, you'll get all of the Freeview and mainland TV channels, and there's about 30 of them. Uh, you'll get Sky Igloo as well, if you want to subscribe to that. So great variety uh, of TV, and there's heaps more capacity if we decided to double the number of channels, which we could easily do, then uh, that gives people all that extra choice but uh, at the moment uh, things are going well and uh, the digital from the Takahul site we've made a few changes to one of our links there and uh, that's been going pretty well too so very happy with the way it's all come together a bit of a nightmare at one point though yeah. you imagine yeah and um, just essentially um, mainland will be more accessible to to a much wider range of viewers in the Nelson region. Yes, our audience has improved, uh, well increased dramatically uh, as we've improved that uh, quality of the signal. Uh, the, the output power from the transmitters when you go digital it works out about 10 times. So where our transmitter before was say putting out uh, you know, 3 kilowatts of power, uh, that's equivalent now to 30 kilowatts of power because of the, di the way the digital works. So a lot more people watching and a lot easier to watch. You don't have to fiddle around with your TV so much. You just push auto tune and the little school kid inside the TV runs around and sorts it all out. So yes, <laughs> works well. Great. Yeah. Thanks for coming into the studio today, Gary. You're welcome. TV in the South Island goes digital on 28 April. If you don't have Freeview, Sky, Igloo or Telstra Clear TV by then, this is what you'll see on your TV. Get your hands on some Roman technology. Discover the amazing legacy of this great empire. Check the Nelson Provincial Museum website for special ticket deals. Nelson Tire Center. Great prices, great service. Buy your own Bryford trailer. All types, all sizes. See Colin Douglas for your tires and batteries. Waimea Telecommunications, specializing in free-to-air satellite TV, computer cabling, telephone systems, wireless and broadband internet installations. Call Julian Toon on 544-4203. And on behalf of the team here at Mainland Television News, thanks for joining us. Have a safe weekend and we'll be back again next week with the latest in news and events from around the region. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.
Hi, I'm Duncan from Health 2000 Nelson and Richmond. At Health 2000, we are the experts in your good health and well-being. If you have questions about natural health, we can answer them. Health 2000 Nelson, Motueka and our Richmond Mall store is now by the new entrance.